David Chislett, good afternoon. What do you say? Good, 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 good morning, good evening, good, yeah, good afternoon, wherever good afternoon. you are in the world. <laughs> there we are. Just, yeah, sorry, we're just fast becoming, um, it's becoming a thing because yeah. I've watched a number of your podcasts, of uh, which, what, what are you sitting on at the moment, podcast wise? It must be in the 30s or 40s. No, no, it's 20 interviews. Okay, okay. But of my own podcast. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. But you've, uh, well, so not quite prolific. But, <laughs> but yeah, um, you're a man who, who uh, wears many hats. And um, I'm not going to ask you to regurgitate your bag because that's all freely available on, I think, in pretty much most of those wonderful interviews that I spent a lot of time on um, more recently. Um, all of that stuff's in there. So, um, of the many hats that you have worn in your life, from being a musician to now being an active commercial poet to being a keynote speaker to being a trainer to being so many things to so many people, um, which of those hats fits you best in your opinion? Well, what I'm coming to realizing is that I spent a lot of time collecting the material to make one hat, which is the one I'm currently wearing. Um, and without all of the things and the steps that I had taken in the past leading up until this point in time, I would not have this hat. So I guess it's just a way of saying that I'm pretty sure that I am exactly where I'm supposed to be right now. And where that is, is helping people to get in touch with their creativity so they can live more fulfilled lives and reach their potential. Mm -hmm. So I, I get a sense that you <clears throat> didn't necessarily um, spot a gap in the market. Um, mm, you no. created a market. You did create a market in the gap because I get a sense that certainly when you started out, there was a lot of confusion or even uh, or lack of understanding as to the point of 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 it. You know, um, I remember thinking way back in the beginning that. You know, how could somebody possibly make an, a living out of doing this? Because it didn't seem tangible to me, if that's the right term. Yeah, I, I did think I'd spotted a gap in the market. And, and once I dived into that gap, I realized that in actual fact, there were several other people who'd been there a lot longer than me and had published loads of books and been doing it for a very long time. Um, which just reinforces the, the, the breadth and the depth of the issue around our capacity to be creative and how our society deals with it or chooses not to deal with it, to be more accurate. Um, it's a massively needed capacity that needs to be developed for us to survive all of the challenges that we face. And yet, yeah, you know, your impression was the same as mine. It's like, oh, here's a gap in the market. No one's doing this. And actual fact, there's tons of people who are very involved in this field, but the kind of zeitgeist hasn't quite twigged onto the fact that we are all creative and it's just a matter of figuring out for yourself how your creativity works so that you could do more of it. Okay, so when you discovered that there were all of these people doing, already doing this, as you put it, yeah. um, there would have been a moment of trepidation of like, okay, well, <laughs> it's oversubscribed, so let me move yeah. on. And yet you didn't. Um, yeah. What was the motivation? Well, it was a bit like, studying literature at university and still wanting to be a poet. Um, you know, there's, you can't hope to compete with the established masters. So you're left with two choices, give up and run away and do something else or do what you do in the way that you do it regardless. And I'm not a professor, I'm not a, I'm not a researcher, I'm not a neuroscientist, but what I am is an active creative person who has been actually for a very long time and who's worked with a lot of other creatives. And so what I mainly do actually is kind of bring a lot of these disparate thoughts and theories and, and researches together and try to distill the most simple truths out of them to make them available to more people. Hmm. Um, so I'm not trying to pretend that I'm Mahali Csikszentmihalyi or, or, or David Eagleman or any one of these renowned and highly qualified experts on creativity. But I'm someone who understands that material, has practical working experience of it, and is kind of trying to bring that to a wider audience through my own work. Mm -hmm. And and obviously, ha having done this now for a number of years, 
um, you, you've, you've seen, and obviously by virtue of the fact that you were in business, is that uh, as the second that people understand what it is that you can bring, which I think is, you know, it's not something that you can necessarily do in an, in an elevator pitch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I tried, <laughs> <laughs> um, but there clearly seems to be, I don't, and, and maybe it's I don't know, post pandemic or even pre pandemic, where there's this kind of urgency in people to to not keep doing what they've always done and finding ways yeah. to to reinvent or reimagine themselves and also the businesses that they work in. Yeah, I mean, the pandemic has, has caused a seismic change in attitudes towards work and where and how it should take place. And definitely, if I reflect on my experiences pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, people are a lot more open. But I do still face the fundamental challenge of people not really seeing the value in what I am talking about when I say, hey, I want you to be more creative. Um, I still haven't quite got the hook that gets me in the front door Hmm. um once i managed to get myself in through the front door you know give me two minutes and and i've got people but i'm still trying to figure out that that little golden that golden hook to to really just snag people and say oh yeah that's exactly what we need Hmm. um but you know despite the fact that things are changing fast and that everybody i think kind of realizes that in essence we need to change the way we're doing many many things on this planet there's still massive resistance to change. Um, people have all sorts of bundled up reasons for not wanting to change. And, you know, people are not stupid. They realize that if you're going to be creative, that implies changing stuff. <laughs> and that's not really what everyone wants. But, but is it not that you, you're not selling change? You're, you're selling innovation in the sense it's a, it's a, it's a shift in in thinking a shift in approach or even the acceptance of the possibility that we all have creativity in all of us well y- yes but that's on the proactive side right so you can basically either be the victim of change you can anticipate change or you can make change mm-hmm. um what is inescapable is change um and i think most people would you know the, the being the author of the change part is a little bit uncomfortable and so yes i what I'm really trying to do is to help equip people with tools to deal better with the changes which inevitably will take place in their lives. And so much of what you present is is innate. It's already in them. They just haven't yep. realized it. Correct. Hmm. I mean, yeah, everyone's solved a problem before. Everyone's had one good idea. Uh, everyone's had a fantasy or a five-year plan. Uh, all of those things involve what we now understand as creativity, you know, activation of three specific areas of the brain in order to engage with a reality that does not yet exist. Mm. And I think so much of what you do is that you initiate triggers um, <clears throat> with, with, with each audience that you sit with, where, um, as I say, you're not necessarily giving them the textbook or the, the rule book. Um, you, are, you are literally reminding them or even just welcoming in things that they already carry with them every single day. And maybe even more importantly, I spend a lot of time myth busting, you know, that you don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be a tortured soul. You don't have to be some kind of super special individual uh, in order to be creative. And that uh, the the conflation of art and creativity is is a false one. And that in actual fact, creativity is the source and art is merely a product of that function Mm. much in the same way as innovation is that you were just mentioning Mm. what's in it for you a sense of purpose and fulfillment um a, a a constantly challenging and changing environment where i'm forced to learn a lot all the time Mm. uh, and to practice what i preach (laughs) (laughs) um and I think, you know, for the first time in my life, really being engaged in something that I totally and utterly believe in. Mm. And it, it shows, I think, you know, again, just reflecting on on the interviews that, that you have done <clears throat> to date is that um, a lot of these people, very senior, very specialist uh, practitioners, um, 
what I found remarkable was just you could see these kind of eureka moments where they they are to your very popular term joining the dots. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which um, which it, which was lovely it is lovely to see because I think you know as you 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 know you point out that you're not a specialist in any particular area. You're 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 grossly generalist, but mm. collectively um, you are able to elicit something in people and you kind of change their gear if um and and have them approach themselves and their and their own challenges um in a new way well that's the ultimate objective every time yes um, um yeah yes ask <laughs> <laughs> um you you have kind of answered the earlier question well the, the question i wanted to ask now but from the time that you've started to where you are now, I, I do get a sense that there's definitely more general knowledge or um, a greater understanding or willingness to embrace uh, and accept that we are all fundamentally creative. Um, you mentioned the hurdles that you still have to overcome, mm. but do, do you think that there is, you know, generally speaking, that 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 people are more open? to it, not from a desperation perspective, because as you said, the, the world is in a fraught state um, and people are looking for, for answers. But this, what you offer um, is one of the many ways that someone who's been in business for a number of years, grown a business to a certain size, and then looking to obviously change it up. The number of industri industries that you, that you talk to um, is diverse um, or are diverse. Um, but there does seem to be a growing curiosity because you're not a tarot reader. You're not, <laughs> but, but yet yeah. I think there is some weird expectation from certain sectors where you are expected to come in and you're going to reimagine their whole world. Yet the point is for them to do the heavy lifting. You are yeah. really just the guide. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think what the pandemic did change for a lot of people is the realization that not only could they change but they actually quite enjoyed changing and the change was empowering mm. and that once they were able to work from home and set their work hours and set up their work environment exactly as they liked that they were more productive which made them more fulfilled which made them happier and i think a lot of light bulbs went on through that kind of sequence of events where a lot of people were like wait a second i don't need this nonsense <laughs> of the way that i was being managed or handled and you know we've all seen loads about the great resignation i mean whether that was even actually a thing or not is another debate for another day. But I think what a lot of people did realize was that our assumptions about the way things had to work were false. You know, the, I think pretty much everyone accepted the wisdom that there was no way that everybody could work remotely because people would just be too demotivated, too distracted, and would never get their stuff together and work wouldn't be done. And the polar opposite was proved to be true during the pandemic. And I think that has made a lot of people go, well, what else am I assuming about my life and my work that's actually complete flim flam? Um, and yeah, so therefore people are a little more open to engaging with the idea that, hey, let's do some thought experiments and upside down a few of our other preconceptions and see what, what falls out. So then would you not label it if you had to label it the Great Reset? Was that not the Great Reset? <laughs> <laughs> I am not answering that question <laughs> using those words. <laughs> no, I mean it. I mean it from the point of view is that COVID was a was a terrible time for obviously for for a great many people on so many levels. But what it did do was talk to the thing that you've just said that so many realizations that up to that point had not been realized. It was the ultimate campaign. I, I think I think more of what happened is that the the, the, the democratizing potential of the digital world uh, finally got a, a living example for people to refer to, and that the authority and the power of of in particular middle management was completely usurped and and, and upstaged, and that the the promise and and the potential of the individual was brought to the fore. I would not call that a great reset, rather more than a, an object demonstration 
of how much time and money and effort we've been wasting for decades uh, by insisting that people are idiots who can only do their work if they are highly monitored and controlled by people who've done a specific kind of qualification at a specific school. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very wary of the Great Reset because of the extreme right-wing nonsense that has unfortunately attached itself to that phrase. Hmm. But it, what certainly has occurred is that it has empowered the average person to question the way things are being done. Hmm. 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 And I think, you know, with that, as you say, to to what's been attached to it, and it really is just the term, but I do think that there has been a recalibration um, for each and every person in the world because each and every person was affected in some way by virtue of. <clears throat> so in order to be able to then take the next step and to be equipped in a world where there is no rule book, you are one of those people who are helping people with their stuff that they've got with them that yep. gives the highly qualified or those that are not, but what you come with in the world, that's kind of, there is a now, I think, greater need for, for the likes of you in the space to be able to equip people and, and help them, right? Yeah, I, you know, I think creativity is power because when you can make stuff, that means you can influence your environment, which means you can generate more options for yourself, which gives you greater freedom of choice. Hmm. And I just read a really nice description in a friend of mine's newsletter, uh, Cliff Goldmacher, he's actually one of the people I interviewed on my podcast, where he quoted this really nice um, sort of state of mind about creativity, where you need to be macro patient and micro impatient. And the idea being that you've got to be really macro patient about the big picture, about the long term. But it's very important to be micro impatient about the smaller steps, about learning stuff and joining the dots and putting the little pieces together. Because quite often the big picture is not apparent when you start. And I think traditionally we're told that it should be, that you have to have the goal, the, 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 the a grand vision, and then you start assembling the bits and pieces. But in actual fact, by internalizing the bits and pieces, by being micro impatient and getting out there and engaging, the big picture starts to emerge. Mm. And what I like so much about that particular description is that it clears up an issue which I've had before, which is it's quite easy as a white middle age, middle class, you know, Western European human being to say that creativity gives you control, gives you freedom. Um, because obviously you've, you've got your hands somewhere to some degree on the levers of, of power, of, of influence and of access. Whereas if you're in a township in somewhere like South Africa, that sounds like a bit of a false comfort. But if you are micro impatient and you just take every single step that you possibly can to acquire all as many bits and pieces as possible and allow the image, the picture, the, the process to emerge in time and you are macro patient, yes, the the road from A to B and finally to Z will possibly be or probably be a lot longer than for somebody who has access to, to stuff. Mm. But the, the logic is inescapable. It will still happen. Mm. And, and no part of it can never be seen as failure. You will, you will never fail as no. long as you try. Correct. As long as you keep going, yes. as long as you keep going to the next step, being impatient about what next, how can I get better? What did I do wrong? What else can I pick up? The bigger picture will emerge. Mm -hmm. um, so, appetite. I really like that quote. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, thought, that's a really nice thought. It's a very empowering way of looking at the world. In, in, <clears throat> in all of the time that you've been doing the work that you're doing now, is there, is there any single um, client or individual that you've worked with where they've really embraced what you shared with them to the point that you could almost share it as testimonial to go, here was person X when I first met them and this is where they are now. <laughs> you can't claim it all, of course, but yes. No, no. Well, <laughs> that's what's so interesting about this, right? Because one little light bulb moment has a lot of unforeseen uh, consequences. Hmm. And so there are a couple of people I can think of who, you know, we, 
we had some pretty intense conversations around staff or they attended a workshop who later have com gone home and completely changed their entire plan and their, and their entire business model, which has taken them in a completely different direction. Um, and I think if there's anything that's important about creativity, it's the ability to do that kind of thing, is to let go of your judgment and your opinion of what is good and bad, especially when it's your own stuff. You know, it's really, it's really difficult to let go of stuff that, in your opinion, is good and right, and this is going to work. And, you know, not from an egotistical point of view, but just, you know, this is where you've arrived at, this is what you've worked out. Um, and then someone comes along and drops a mind bomb on you, the ability to go, oh, wait a second, that changes everything. That's what's so challenging sometimes about creativity is to release the judgment mm. and to reassess and regroup and go further. And so anyone I've ever worked with who has um, taken benefit away from, from our sessions there have always been people who have been able to do that more easily than others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it is, <clears throat> I think, the higher up the chain you go, the, the harder it is to convince those people to embrace that way of thinking. Because, as we were saying earlier, is that there's a fear of loss of control because so many people have the perception that they are in control. The reality is that they're not. But... Yep. Um, you put this in front of them and it's like, oh, we don't want people thinking for themselves. Oh, no, the heaven forbid what would happen. The world would go mad. Yet mm -hmm. the benefit, if you're a manager and you're and you're promoting that down, you know, down the line, uh, the benefit to the business is extraordinary. Um, yeah, it's exponential. Yes, exponential. If you think about it, your average organization has probably got 5% of their staff actively thinking forward, thinking creatively. Can you imagine if they found a way to access the inherent creativity of the other 95%? Yeah. How much easier and faster would it be to change and adapt to, to, uh, to changing market situations? Mm -hmm. David, you just published your, <clears throat> your third collection of poetry. Um, how has that, how's that been received? Well, I must say, I did a bit of a stealth release with the poetry. <laughs> <laughs> like everything you do. <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've been fond of making a song and dance of things as well. But, but this one was, was very much kind of, I got the book out and I just pressed, I just pressed the button and, and it was there out in the world. Yeah. I, I, I still need to actually exert a lot more effort in letting people know that it exists. Hmm. Um, but so far, so good. Um, I've had pretty good reactions to it. Yeah. Um, it's uh, for me, it was a very important book to release because it, it fills a gap in between the previous two books that Join probably that. nobody else. Well, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, but but literally in that the first book released in 2010 mm. was generated through a Facebook project and the second book was generated through a Patreon project. Um, and it's like I didn't write any other poetry between those two projects, which just isn't true. Mm. And that's what's in the book that's just come out now. That's what's in B-sides. Mm, mm, mm. So it was a sort of almost like a retrospective exercise to say, hey, hang on a second. I don't only do social media projects. Here's, here's the rest of the stuff. <laughs> yeah, and that, I think if you, if you put the three together, um, it does, it's, the, it's, a, it's a perfect, uh, perfect triangle. Um, and, well, a trilogy of sorts, one could say. Whew. Well, I... I the one thing I've learned from publishing poetry is that what I think about my poetry is a completely worthless waste of breath. <laughs> um, so if, if other people begin to draw that conclusion, uh, I would be very happy. I mean, that, that's a nice, there's a nice uh, roundness or completeness to that. Yeah, um, I, I'm, you know, I think what, what definitely is true is that I write in bursts yes. and the, the beginning of each burst generally involves some kind of a change in my voice and style. And so I would be intrigued if people could actually see that from uh, for you or someone like you to B sides to with all of you to actually track that change in voice. Mm. I don't really have an opinion on that. I'm not sure if I could could say for certain if that was true or not. <laughs> Which I like. I like the fact that you can't, and uh, because again, that's the I think that's the beauty, as you say, you. You cannot be your own critic. You can't judge what you do. It, 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 and you've said it in many of your interviews as well, is that it's, 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 
the affirmation or the confirmation <clears throat> will come from others. Um, you know, you are there to deliver the work and um, as you do with all of the work that you do, the, the keynote speaking, the um, the training through to uh, the, the, the creative stuff, that your your affirmation comes from your audience, not, you know, from from you, which um, I respect that. Yeah. Um, so what's next? Well, um, next year, I am definitely putting my ideation canvas out into the world. Um, I don't know if, if anyone listening is aware of the whole canvas sort of methodology. It's something I think that comes out of design thinking. So it's the business model canvas and the value proposition canvas and all these kinds of things. And I've developed one that'll help you develop your own ideas called the ideation canvas. So I'll be pushing that out into the world and I will be taking the video podcast interview things that I've been doing on YouTube and stripping out the audio of those and then recording reflection episodes on each interview and then releasing all of that episode by episode uh, onto traditional podcast platforms as an actual audio podcast. So those are my two biggies. Um, I'm still threatening to write a book about, about like a, a user's handbook for creativity called Rebel Reject Create. Um, <laughs> Great title. But I have kind of been muttering about that for two years now. And to be honest with you, I'm no further than when I first started muttering about it. Uh, but next year might be the year. Um, I'm starting to feel like the idea is coalescing into something. So it should happen fairly soon. <laughs> so, so much of it's already written. You just need to write it down. <laughs> Yeah, I think what I don't want to do is is, is write a book about creativity. Like, mm. you know, what I want to do is 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 put together a practical guide, a, a user a user book, mm. a workbook mm. uh, for people that is actually of of direct day to day practical use. So, it, it's it's a little more complicated than just writing it all down. It's also figuring out how what sort of methodology to use to present it in an interactive practical yeah. usable way yes yeah i do think it'll be a, a multimedia project ultimately um well as they all are all of a sudden <laughs> <laughs> well you'll get one part <clears throat> and then you'll plug into another part and then you'll get a package in the post uh with <laughs> and <laughs> and things to blow up but uh, yeah no, but it sounds exciting and creative as always um hmm. You know, and um, what I what I love about your work is that you you never rest on any aspect. You are continually challenging yourself. You can you know in the same way that you challenge your audiences. Um, but your curiosity is the thing that I find most uh, infectious. Um, and I think if anyone has been to any class of yours or uh, listened or watched in any of your interviews. That to me is the thing that uh, that that in each one I, I get a sense of that genuine passion. Um, you know, to one of the earlier questions that I asked around, you know, you find yourself at this stage of your life having done a great many things, but I definitely get a sense that what you are doing, uh, call it a calling, um, but you are genuinely passionate about this curiosity that you have and your investment in empowering and improving people's lives. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, thank you, first of all. Um, if you told me five years ago that what I would end up be doing was all about helping other people, I probably would have burst out laughing and rolled around on the floor. Um, it still feels somewhat uncomfortable to me to even say those words, but I can't I can't deny the history. If I look back at everything that I've always done, that's what it's always been about. I mean, that's what you do as a band manager, as a, as a music critic, as a promoter, as a, you know, when you're doing PR, I mean, you're, you're furthering the creative agendas of other people. That's the purpose of your existence. And it was when I, only when I really figured that out that I suddenly went, oh, okay, I'm, I'm happy enough to talk about helping people now. You know, I had to first realize that I was already doing it before I was happy to put that sticker on it. But yeah. <laughs> that is what it is <laughs> and i think i think you know um certainly in my case i i'm i'm far better at promoting other people than i am myself so i think for someone like yourself who is you are your business um 
yeah, it, it, it seems it, it, it's, yeah, it's unnatural for you to be seen to be promoting yourself, which the, the fact that you have that realization that actually, it's, I don't know whether it's a case of feeling worthy or I don't know, or, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, an interesting one, but yeah. Um, yeah, just keep doing what you're doing and, and, and don't, don't, don't change. Well, do change everything quite often. Uh, because that's what you do um but yeah please keep doing what you're doing and uh having you there um you know i think rebelling rejecting and creating um yeah you're a you're a force of nature so yeah. thank you jason <laughs>